God is good. And all the time. God is good. Amen. What a blessed day it is to be able to come together to be with you and to be able to share the good news that Jesus reigns, that he is Lord and that we should seek first his kingdom. Our mission this year has been to seek first the kingdom of God in everything that we do and everything that we look at as we go through this world. I, I think this quote from Tony Evans is incredibly important as we seek first his kingdom. The only way you will be able to see life with clear vision is when you view a life, when you view all of life from a kingdom perspective. How important and powerful that truth is. If you're here with us today and you're watching um, with us on Facebook, you should know that on Facebook, um, Wade has made it available for a uh, kids connection and kindergarten through first grade, as well as the younger kids, to be able to have some Bible class curriculum. And that's available through the different web pages or the Facebook pages that we have for our kids, such as the Rocketdyne Road Kids Connection page and then the Rocketdyne um, kindergarten, except it's just kind, slash first grade Facebook page. I'm going to have the videos available on the Rocketdyne Road webpage as well, our, our Facebook page as well, to be able to see that. Now, if you're watching from our webpage, from ccneosho.com, that is also available down below the video, the live stream that's going on, where you can look at the different, um, the, the different curriculum stuff that's available for the different kids' ages. The only problem is uh, we haven't been able to figure out how to get the video that Wade made on the web page. And so if you want to, go to our Facebook page later on. I'll have the video up there on the Facebook page on Rockadine Road Church Christ's page to be able to see the video that Wade has, especially for Kids Connection. He walks through along with them on the PowerPoint that's available. And I think it'll be a big blessing for your kids to continue to have Bible class and have it with them. And so go ahead and uh, get online, print out the uh, pages, let them be able to do some coloring, some word search, some mazes, stuff like that, and it'll be a big blessing. The one group is studying Psalms. The other group is studying about how Jesus heals the official son. And I think it's incredibly important, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we recognize this truth. And that's part of what the sermon is all about. If we're going to seek first the kingdom of God, we have to recognize that Jesus came for everybody, not just for special people, not just for adults, not just for people that are, are on their deathbeds. He came for all of us, for all aspects of life, and he came to give his life that we may have life at all times. That's why the sermon last week I preached on Easter, I shared the truth that comes from Isaiah 52 and 53, that Jesus had to be a suffering, dying Messiah for us to show us that we are no longer slaves to sin, enslaved to death, which means we can now live different lives with a better perspective, a better kingdom vision perspective, where we look into this world and see what God is doing and where he is going and how we can join and be a part of it as citizens of his kingdom. And I think that's incredibly important that we enter into our vision, our view of things that are around us that way, and we recognize that truth. And I also think it's important that we share that with our kids. So take the time, either today or sometime this week, and go over the Bible curriculum with them and talk to them about Psalms or how Jesus heals the official son and share with your children how incredibly important it is that Jesus came for them. So that way they have a foundation of kingdom vision. That way they have a foundation of seeking the kingdom first and his righteousness in all things. And I promise you it will be a blessing for you and your household. Sure, as Bryce talked about earlier when he was doing the Lord's Supper, you might have to practice some of the fruit of the Spirit when you share that, such as patience, because I know how hard it is sometimes to teach our own kids. Um, my household, I, I know exactly how hard it can be at, at times. But don't worry about it. Share the good news with them. Try to keep patient and be a blessing. And then at the, uh, while you're doing it, praise God and give glory to God that we have teachers in our school system and as well here at Rockadine Road Church of Christ that share, that teach to our kids at times where we struggle with patience on that kind of stuff. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to Matthew chapter 5 with me. If we're going to have kingdom vision, we need to get into the, into the sermon that Jesus shares what kingdom vision is all about. We're going to start with reading about the Beatitudes, which is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And I think we're going to notice something interesting here as we get into reading the Beatitudes. And let me preface it this way before we read it in Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. I grew up being told and thinking, maybe I wasn't told, but I think I heard this from sermons. But for most of my life, I thought the Beatitudes were a reward system. 
I thought they were a certain attitude, a certain behavior, a way of being that I had to strive for, that I had to attain. Otherwise, I wouldn't get specific rewards from Jesus. And I think that's wrong. Because if you go through this, and if you logically think about the things Jesus is looking at, talking about, and then you get into the context of the situation, you're going to begin to understand that you can't possibly live into all these beatitudes and have these behaviors. And if you try to, you're going to look crazy. The world is going to look at you and go, what in the world are you doing all this for? Why would I want to follow Jesus? And you're going to even see in the context of the beatitudes itself that it kind of contradicts itself at the beginning and end if you take this as you have to have this list of behaviors in order to receive rewards. I think Jesus is saying something a little bit different, and I think, that, I think that's really important. And I think a good way of noticing what Jesus is saying here is by reading the Beatitudes and reading them slowly. I know for some of you, when you hear me preach, you have a hard time with the fact that I talk fast. I get excited. I'm sorry. I, get, I think I love sharing the good news of God, and my brain's going 100 miles a minute. My mouth is trying to keep up with where my brain is at, and I don't want to forget anything, and I don't want to stumble or misuse the Word of God and misshare things. But there are just times when we're in the Word of God that we have to take our time we have to read slowly. We have to wonder as when Jesus got on the side of that mountain on that day and talked to this large crowd that was following him, if he didn't say this and give people time to think about what he's saying. And the other key is that we have to remember that Jesus was human. And being just like you and I, if you've ever hung out with Jimmy and I, you would know exactly what I'm talking about here. We like to have fun and we like to joke. And sometimes we say things um, in, a, in a way in order to get you thinking, in order to get your mind going, where you go, oh, that's funny, but oh, man, that means something so much more. Let me give you a really good example of when Jesus does that. Jesus sees four fishermen who have been following him and wanting, to, wanting him to be their rabbi, and he goes to the sea, and they've been fishing all night. It's Peter, James, John, um, and Peter, James, John, and uh, Andrew, that's right, Peter's brother Andrew, are there out fishing. And they don't catch anything all night. So Jesus meets them in the morning on the shore and says, have you guys caught anything? And they say, no, we haven't caught anything all night. He says, go ahead and cast your nets on the other side of the boat. Go out and fish again. And they catch a whole mess of fish. And they come back in and they realize that a miracle has just happened. And Jesus says something that if you don't recognize the, the funniness of this, you're gonna go, what in the world? If you think this is literal, you're going to have issues with what Jesus says. He says, go, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He's not literally telling them to cast nets over people. Pay attention to that. He's teaching them in a funny way, connecting with their culture, that they, he's got a better way for them. He's got a better way of being a blessing for other people. He's not saying, let's go and get hooks and snag people. He's not saying that at all. So as we read through the Beatitudes and as we read through slowly— I want you to notice some of the hyperbole that's in there. I want you to notice some of the logical differences that are in there when you read the first one and then you read the last one. And I want you to notice that it's a, not a list of behaviors that you have to have in order to be rewarded by Jesus. Instead, it just might be something else. So let's read through the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, verse 1 through 12. <clears throat> Seeing the crowds... Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay. Take a moment and think about that list. And notice, if you celebrate, if you practice all the behaviors that are on that list, well, you might stumble over some of the rewards. Let me give you an example. First one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the the spiritual zeros. For they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But then you get to the bottom one that's on the screen. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sakes. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, how do you get persecuted for righteousness sake if you've not been spiritually strong? Do you see that? Do you see how those two don't work? You can't practice those two at the same time. How can you be a spiritual zero? How can you be poor in the spirit, missing out, and yet be striving in the spirit to be like Jesus and be persecuted for it? Or how about another one? The last one, verse number 11 and 12. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you on my account. Rejoice and be glad. Uh, didn't I read earlier that I'm supposed to mourn? Blessed are those who mourn. How do you balance that out? Unless we look at it and we begin to wonder if Jesus didn't mean something else than a list of behaviors that we should have in order to be rewarded. Instead, I think we need to look at the context of what's going on here to have a better understanding of what it means to seek the kingdom of heaven and recognize the truth that Jesus is king and we need to follow him in order to be blessed, in order to be transformed, in order to live into these blessings that Jesus ends up sharing. So if you will, if you have your Bibles, let's instead, let's jump up into context and let's see what's been going on before this and why Jesus might be saying some of these things. So let's start in chapter 4, verse 23, and maybe we'll see something going on here. And Jesus went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news, the gospel of the kingdom. And he was healing every disease and every affliction among all of the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds of people followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, which means ten cities. These were rich cities, Greek cities, above north of the Sea of Galilee. And there were also people from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So Matthew lets us know that this huge group of people have been following him from all over Israel. People that have heard about Jesus, heard him preach the good news, and have witnessed him share the good news in healing, casting out demons, and bringing rightness into the lives of people. Brothers and sisters, you've got to pay attention to this. There are Greeks here, there are Gentiles here, there are Jewish people here, there are Samaritans here, there are people from Syria here that are from up north where the Assyrians were. There is a mixture of people that are coming to Jesus and hearing this. It's a large crowd of people. There are women, there are men, there are children, there are older people. There are probably people of different color skin, people of different um, backgrounds, people of different wealth. And they're following Jesus because he is making a change in the world. And they're able to witness it. He's healing people. He's casting out demons. These people are coming from every single walk of life. And there's a large crowd. And so we start out the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus noticing this crowd following him. He goes up on top of a mountain and sits down and his disciples join him. And he begins to teach saying, blessed are I think what we need to recognize here is that the context is Jesus is using show and tell. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the people that are following him. And he's saying, here's what the kingdom of heaven is about. 
Blessed are people who find themselves in these situations, such as being poor in spirit. And let's start with poor in spirit. I think this is one of the most important ones for us to look at because brothers and sisters in Christ, we have fallen short of the vision of the kingdom of God whenever we don't look out in the world around us, whenever we're going to Walmart, as Bryce talked about earlier, and notice that there are spiritual zeros around us. These are the people that we, for some reason, in our heart of hearts, when we're looking at people, go, oh, they just can't follow Jesus. They're they're never going to be able to transform. They're never going to be able to change from their ways. Another way of looking at this, talking about spiritual zeros and who they are, is Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, talks about an evangelist, a a missionary that was in um, northern uh, Mexico that was sharing a Bible class with a bunch of students and talking to them about Jesus. And he noticed that in his Bible classes, as he would spend time with them, by the way, these people were poor. These people were financially unstable. They didn't really have much, just the clothes on their back and the food that they were able to eat that day and wondering what's going to happen the very next day to them. They were that poor and destitute. He would have Bible classes with them, and he would ask them questions, and they would never, ever answer him. And he began to realize that their physical poverty had translated into spiritual poorness, where they didn't feel that they had the authority, the right the, the behavior to share an answer about God. So instead, they would sit back and try to listen to the message. They would sit back and feel like somebody else who was more spiritually rich than they were would need to hear this. I think what we've done with the Sermon on the Mount, especially with the Beatitudes, is we've taken those Beatitudes in the past and we've gone through them and said, all right, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I need to reinterpret this because Jesus tells me to be strong in the spirit. Paul says we should have the fruit of the spirit, as we talked about during communion. And if we have the fruit of the spirit, that means that we're working on being strengthened in the spirit, right? And don't we pray for each other to be filled by the spirit? Why would Jesus start out his sermon by saying, Blessed are those who are spiritually poor? And so we've tried to reinterpret this. We've tried to change the words around a little bit about what they mean. And we've said things like, uh, maybe being spiritually poor, being poor in spirit means to be humble. But that's not what Jesus said. That's not what's in the original language. He literally says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we can't go and reframe that and try to make that another way that fits better for us today. And our, this is what you do, this is the reward you get, um, culture that we have. Instead, maybe we need to look at it and say, maybe Jesus in his show and tell that's going on as he begins this sermon about seeking the kingdom of heaven first and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Maybe he's looking around at this large crowd of people that's been following him and noticing that there are people that who may be financially poor, but they are definitely spiritually poor that are around him who have never made stepped foot in a synagogue maybe because they were Samaritans like the woman in John chapter 4 who asked Jesus, My, our fathers say we can worship on this mountain, but your fathers say worship in Jerusalem. What should we do? And Jesus says, true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. <laughs> That's funny. Jesus tells us, blessed are the poor in spirit, the spiritual zeros. But then he says, blessed are those who worship in spirit and truth. Which one is it, Jesus? Well, if we look at it in context, he's pointing out the people in the crowd, maybe not by fingers, But people are feeling this. When they hear, blessed are the poor in spirit, they go, oh, I can inherit the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven can be for me, even though the the leaders over here said that I can't be spiritually strong? And Jesus is calling us out from being spiritual zeros as that being our identity to saying, I'm giving you a transformative identity. This ministry that I have is to come and heal the sick, to cast out demons, to make a newness come into this world that you may no longer be slaves to sin and slaves to death and you may have a newness of life. So happy, blessed are the poor in spirit, the spiritual zeros, because with me, they can have the kingdom of heaven. I think this is so important to look at the Beatitudes this way because this changes our whole entire view of the Sermon on the Mount here forth going on after that. Because in order to look at the 
the Beatitudes the way that I've looked at it before, I've had to kind of reinterpret it in my mind and define it as, well, maybe this is, will be about a time, sometime in the future. Maybe when Jesus comes again, I'll be able to be poor in spirit and inherit the kingdom of heaven. I'll be able to mourn and be comforted. I'll be able to hunger and thirst for righteousness and be satisfied. And I'll be able to live into all these behaviors. Because I'm going to be flat out honest. I can't live into most of these. If I try to live into these behaviors, I end up struggling and falling short. I think what Jesus is doing in the Beatitudes, what he's calling out is he's looking at this crowd of people that have been following him and saying, guess what the kingdom of heaven is all about? It's about me coming into their lives and changing everything. That they can be blessed. They can mourn and be comforted. They can rejoice in the sight of persecution. They can hunger for righteousness and be filled. I think this is so important as we continue on to think about this because in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus starts out his ministry, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 61, verse, chapter, or Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 2. He opens up a scroll when he's in the synagogue. They ask him to read something, to teach something. And he opens up the scroll and he reads this. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now, remember he said, blessed are the spiritual zero, the the, the, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If he's quoting Isaiah 61.1 and saying, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, that would make him a hypocrite if he's saying, you have to be poor in spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's not what he's saying. He's saying people that are poor in spirit are going to be blessed because of him, because the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim those that mourn, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. And then he says, this has been fulfilled in your presence, claiming that he being God in the flesh and their presence being the son of God is the fulfillment. And he begins to preach about the kingdom of heaven and going out proclaiming the kingdom of God has come. This is what the Beatitudes are about. It's about no matter who you are, no matter how messed up your past has been or whatever it is that you're struggling with at the moment, be it financial insecurity, personal insecurity, that you're not popular, that you're poor in spirit, that you've been sad about things lately, that um, the COVID virus has been keeping us indoors and we've really been struggling with maybe depression, maybe with patience, maybe with being poor in spirit as far as fruit of the spirit goes. Jesus says, I'm here in order to bring blessings to you, all of you, in the midst of what you're struggling with. This is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. So why don't you seek it first? Alfred Edersheim says this. This is so powerful. In the Sermon on the Mount, the promises attaching, for example, to the so-called Beatitudes must not be regarded as the reward for spiritual states with which they are respectively connected not yet as the result. It is not because a man is poor in spirit that his is the kingdom of heaven, in the sense that the one state will grow into the other or be its result. Still less is the one the reward of the other. The connecting link in each case, in each one of the Beatitudes, is Christ Jesus himself, because he has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. What a powerful truth that is. What a powerful truth. If you imagine ourselves being in that time, being up in the Decapolis or being in, uh, around Galilee, being a Jewish person there, or being a Gentile there, being a man or a woman or a child or an older person or poor or rich, if we imagine ourselves being there and watch, noticing this man healing the sick and casting out demons and helping the lame be able to walk and touching the lepers and cleansing them and binding up broken hearts, and we start following him, and he begins to say, that we are all blessed in our states as we are because he will transform us to be able to inherit the kingdom of heaven, to be able to rejoice, to be able to mourn appropriately and be comforted. If we start noticing that, we begin to look in the Sermon on the Mount as dif differently and begin to notice that as we follow Jesus, we can live into the Sermon on the Mount. It's not some future thing that we might attain and grasp. It's obtainable now because Jesus transforms us and we are blessed in whatever situation we've come from. Which means the people that we look at sometimes as we're out and about that we think can't 
there, there's no way that they're going to follow Jesus. Jesus says they can. Which means that the people that think that they're spiritually elites, but yet they're hypocrites and they're, they're hiding things in the closets that, they're, that they don't want other people to know because they, they claim that they're, they've been following Jesus and they're perfect, that Jesus can perfect them in the midst of the things that they're hiding. That he can transform us and make us right and give us life anew. So let's go over the Beatitudes one more time and let, let's look at these and let's look at them for what they really are. We've already done blessed are the poor in spirit. These are the spiritual zeros. These are the people that have been struggling with knowing that they can be religious at all, that they can connect with God at all, who feel like God is far, far away from them. And Jesus says, blessed are you because God's not far away from you. You can be spiritually strong because yours is the kingdom of heaven. What about blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. He's talking about people that have been struggling with depression, those who've recently lost loved ones. He says the kingdom of heaven is about transforming that and bringing comfort into your life. It's not about bringing happiness and like faking it and not like there's no mourning going on right now. It's about entering it. Jesus, God has so entered into our reality by becoming flesh that when we mourn, he knows what we feel. Do you remember Lazarus? Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the grave. He told his disciples that Lazarus is just asleep right now. But when he gets there and he notices all the Jews and Lazarus' sisters crying, what does Jesus do along with them? He weeps. What about the woman who's lost her son and there was a funeral procession going on and Jesus comes into contact and he raises the son from the dead? What does he do before he raises the son from the dead? He joins her in mourning and comforts her. Blessed are those who have been struggling with depression. Blessed are those who have recently lost loved ones. Blessed are those who are really struggling with cabin fever right now because of quarantine. You will be comforted, Jesus says. I've come to transform that. Or what about the meek? I've heard the meek defined so many different ways trying to make us feel like, oh man, it's all right. This idea of meekness is something that we should obtain for and striving for. I've heard meekness has becoming called as strengthness under security or strengthness that has been subdued so that way the strengthness can be used appropriately. I don't think anymore that's what Jesus meant. Meekness literally means shy, timid, insecure. Listen to it this way now. Blessed are the shy. Blessed are the timid. Blessed are the insecure. Blessed are the people on the Sermon on the Mount who are way down the hill because they feel like if I get near all the people, it's going to be scary. They're going to think something about me. Blessed are them because they will inherit the earth. By the way, like I said at the beginning of the sermon, Jesus says some things that are just downright funny if we pay attention to what he's saying. Normally, when we think of meekness, we think of mice. Where do mice live? In the earth. Jesus is literally saying, blessed are they who are meek. Not because meekness is bad, but because that's where you are. You're going to inherit the earth. And Jesus is saying that heaven and earth are coming together through him. And so when he says, blessed are the meek, he's saying, blessed are you who feel shy and intimidated in situations. Because I've come to be transformative for that. You will inherit the earth. Your shyness will be okay. What about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? Blessed are those who are uh, trying to, striving to obtain to make everything right. Those people that annoy some other people that are these Mr. Know-it-alls that are going out and trying to be like, hey, everything's got to be completely right. Blessed are you who think that you're spiritually elite because you're going to be satisfied. And when we hunger and thirst for the true righteousness or for righteousness, and it's not true, Jesus transforms that and brings it into the good righteousness that we should be seeking. What about blessed are the merciful? those who have been taken advantage of. In our society, being merciful is sometimes good, sometimes bad. Sometimes it's honored, sometimes it's not. So a lot of times we look down on people when they're merciful, when they, when they give a handout to somebody, maybe a, a, somebody that's been begging on the side of the road. And we're like, oh, they're just going to use it for alcohol or drugs. And we look down our nose at them and we go, oh, those merciful people. They're just not doing right. It's not really being a blessing for the other person. And Jesus says, you're blessed. 
if people have been doing that to you because you're going to be shown mercy yourself. I'm going to transform things. Let's keep going on. What about blessed are the pure in heart? So those perfectionists, those people that uh, say, hey, you haven't been washing your hands enough lately. Those people that have been, uh, who act like they're always right, who are trying to find that there's something not right in other people. What about those people, those pure in heart, when they go to the restaurant that the waitress or waiter can never get the order exactly right for them? You know who I'm talking about. It might be you. <laughs> I've done it a couple of times in my life. Jesus says you're blessed because he can transform that. The pure in heart will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those people, think about, oh my goodness. Police officers, I, I so, you guys have such a hard job. You guys get called into houses for domestic disputes where a wife or a husband are going at each other. They've been angry with each other. And the police officer ends up oftentimes coming into the house and both of the spouses are angry at that police officer because they're not taking their side. But yet they're trying to make peace. Blessed are the people that come into the middle of situations when people are fighting and those people don't end up liking them because of it. Because you will call it, be called children of God. And Jesus continues on by saying, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, when you refuse to be complicit for, not do, for doing something that's not right. Aren't you blessed? <laughs> right now with COVID, we can say people are being persecuted for righteousness sake on both sides right now. You got people that are saying that it's tyrannical. To, there's tyranny going on right now because we don't have our freedom and things are being held back by this quarantine and stuff like that. And then you've got other people by saying, but it's righteous and good in order to upheld the, uphold the health and the life of other people by abstaining from meeting together so that way they don't get a virus. <laughs> Jesus says, hey, guess what, guys? You're all blessed because yours is the kingdom of heaven. The Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes are for everybody. And I find this so incredibly important that we recognize this because this means that everybody can seek first the kingdom of God, of kingdom of heaven, and God's righteousness. And all these things are available to us. There's not a single one of us that is left out from the Beatitudes. We all fit in. Jesus looks at the whole crowd and says, guess what? You're blessed because I'm here. I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. So let's seek the kingdom of heaven in our lives. Let's seek what it means to be God's people, to inherit the kingdom of heaven, to be comforted, to be satiated from our hunger for righteousness, to inherit the earth. Let's seek what it means to live in his kingdom in the right way. In conclusion, I want to say this because this is a powerful truth. The Beatitudes are not about actions or behaviors that we should strive for in order to get a reward. Let me say that one more time because somebody might mishear this. I do understand that the last one says for your, your reward is the kingdom of heaven, but hear this. The Beatitudes are not about a list of behaviors and actions that we should be striving for in order to get the reward. It's, the truth is it's not about getting the reward. They are about the transformative nature of the kingdom of heaven for everyone, which is only through Jesus. The Beatitudes are about the truth that Jesus came to die for everybody's sins, not just for the spiritually strong and not just for the spiritually weak. He came to die that we may all have life and we may have it abundantly, that we re may recognize that we are no longer captives enslaved to sin and death, but we can live and we can live truly and we can live by loving our neighbors and loving our enemies and being that peaceful fruit of the Spirit-filled person that Jesus came to make. He can take us from whatever situation we've been in the midst of and transform our lives. And that's what the Beatitudes are about. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. I pray the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. I pray the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is a work within us, to his glory in the church and in Christ Jesus be for all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.